Hey, welcome back to Slow Bells. Today I am in Syracuse, New York. Syracuse is one of those crossroads on the Great Loop. From here, some people choose to go uh, west on the Erie Canal towards Buffalo, and others, like me, take a right turn here and go north on the Oswego Canal up towards Canada. But today, I'm going to show you what the Erie Canal is all about. It's been kind of fun going through all the locks and stuff, and hopefully you'll enjoy it too. Check it out. The Erie Canal runs from Waterford, New York, which is a few miles north of Albany, to Buffalo, New York. I would only be doing the eastern half of the Erie Canal. At Syracuse, New York, I would take a right turn and head for Canada on the Oswego Canal. By the way, in both 2018 and 2019, there were no fees charged for using the locks and waterways on the Erie Canal or the Champlain Canal. Initially, the Erie Canal followed along the side of the Mohawk River. The river itself had too much fast-moving water. Later, dams and locks were built on the Mohawk River, and the original Erie Canal was abandoned. But you can still find traces of the original canal. Typically, the Mohawk River and the Erie Canal are now the same thing. Occasionally, however, there will be a section where the river is over here and the canal is over there. Here is how a lock works on the Erie Canal, or for that matter, any lock anywhere. In this example, we will start out with a lock that is at the same water level as the water on the downstream side. The downstream gate is closed, then this valve is opened. Gravity will then cause water to start flooding into the lock. When the water levels are the same, you can open the upstream gate. Going down is a similar process. We close the upstream lock gate and open this valve. Gravity will now cause water to drain out of the lock. When the water levels are the same, we can open up the downstream lock gate, and we are back where we started. By the way, lock gates do not close like this. Instead, they are designed to form an angle when the gates are closed. In this way, the more the water pushes against the gate, the tighter the seal becomes between the two halves of the gate. Each lock will generally provide one of three possible ways to tie up your boat. The first way is to loop a single dock line around a vertical pipe. Your dock line slides along this pipe as the water level inside the lock changes. The second way to tie up uses a vertical steel cable instead of a pipe, but basically works the same way as the pipe. Or the third way to tie up, you just grab onto a rope hanging down the lock walls and hope for the best. Typically, Lynn and I would stand at opposite ends of the boat and we would each grab one of these hanging lines. If you look closely at the red brick walkway running parallel to the docks in Waterford, you will see some kind of design made up of white bricks. This design is actually a brick map of the entire Erie Canal and Hudson River, and the locks along the way. Here are the bricks for Buffalo, New York, and the Niagara River. This brick is for Syracuse, where the Oswego Canal branches off from the Erie Canal. This is the brick for Waterford. You can also see some of the bricks for the many locks in the Waterford area. 
And finally, the brick for New York City at the mouth of the Hudson River. One of the cool things about Waterford is the walking trails. There are many miles of these trails running parallel to both the Champlain Canal and the Erie Canal, used by both foot traffic and bicycles. When you leave Waterford headed westbound, you will need to negotiate five locks. It is not uncommon to leave one lock and see the next one ahead of you in the distance. Many, but not all, of the locks have a place to tie up your boat while you wait your turn to use the lock. It was common practice on slow bells to use these lock tie-up spots for both lunch breaks and overnight stays. There is no charge for using these tie-up locations, but there is usually no water or electrical hookup. You get what you pay for. This strange looking boat is actually a cruise ship that uses the Erie Canal to run from the Hudson River to the Great Lakes. This ship is pretty long but not very tall. Many of the fixed bridges on the Erie Canal are only 20 feet above the water. The sound you are about to hear is the cruise ship slamming into the cement walls of the lock. If you look closely right here, you will see a guy jumping off the cruise ship. His job, assuming he survives the leap, is to sprint along the lock and help tie up the ship inside the lock. I took this video as the cruise ship was leaving the lock. The big bang you are about to hear is the sound of the ship once again slamming into the lock wall. This wall slamming technique kind of reminded me of a dog marking his territory. After another morning walk on the canal trail, we continued on to Amsterdam, New York, where we were just in time to watch some water skiers having fun on the weekend.
We stayed in Amsterdam an extra day to let some wet weather move through. The rain resulted in some high water. It is not unusual for a heavy rain to make the canal rise enough that they shut down some of the locks for a day or two. This happened more than once while we were on the canal. I guess all that water has to go somewhere. We spent one night near a house that was built by General Nicholas Herkimer in 1764. This is an interesting lock. The lock gate on the downstream side moves vertically up and down, and we had to slip under a big cement wall to get inside the lock. The water level inside this lock changes 40 feet, a much bigger lift than we were used to. This sailboat with a seven-foot draft was being single-handed by a woman. Her only crew member was her dog. It was not uncommon to encounter these guillotine-looking gates in the canal. I believe the gates are used for flood control. You definitely don't want to piss off the guy who controls these gates. We had to wait out more rain and more high water and more lock closures in the town of Ilion. During the day, this toy car drifted into the the back of slow bells. Lynn and I were able to lift it out of the water. High water from rain presents a boater with another potential problem. As the water gets higher, there is less room to squeeze under those low bridges. This bridge should be 22 feet above the water. But as you can see, the gauge reads only 20 feet of clearance available to boaters on this day. If your boat required 21 feet of clearance, well, you have a problem. This is the view from above the awning on the upper deck of my boat. This awning, by my calculations, is 15 feet 10 inches above the water. You absolutely must know the height of your boat before doing the Great Loop.
This picture was taken during a weekend stop in Utica, New York. In a way, this was the high point of our trip. From here, you will gradually lose elevation as you travel either west towards the Great Lakes or east towards the Atlantic Ocean. We stopped at the free bulkhead in the town of Rome for a few days, waiting for some wet weather to move through. The city bulkhead looked a little like the movie set from a zombie movie, but you get what you pay for, right? In Rome, I attacked a project that most boat owners eventually get to do, a non-functioning marine toilet. We had poop and toilet parts all over the deck before we finally identified the problem and came up with a fix for it. Good times! Later, the geese and I did some exploring around town. At Sylvan Beach, the Erie Canal joins up with Onata Lake for the next 20 miles. After spending a night at anchor on the lake, Lynn and I headed to Winter Harbor Marina near Syracuse. It was here that Lynn headed back to his home in Texas, and my Seattle friends Tim and Janet joined me after their week of touring in Maine and feasting on lobsters. On a gray morning, we headed out of Syracuse, bound for Oswego, New York. But we weren't on the Erie Canal very long. After one more Erie Canal lock, we made a right turn and headed north on the Oswego Canal. In the town of Phoenix, we pulled over, waiting for a lock to open, and we ended up staying there for lunch. A volunteer group of youngsters called Bridge House Brats took our lunch orders, went to the restaurant, and brought our food back to us where we enjoyed a dockside meal. This has to be the most boater-friendly town I have ever visited. We stayed overnight in the city of Oswego, New York. Then, after Tim helped me raise the mast, Janet took the boat out into Lake Ontario and we headed north in search of Canada. That's all I got for you today. I guess next time we're going to go into Canada. I will see you then. Later.